Welcome everybody to today's Tuesday Talk. I am here with my very special guest, David Yeh. And we are gonna have a little bit of an extended session today as we dive into the world of finances. So David helps busy professionals who are not happy with their current investment strategy. And he helps them get this particular part of their life handled so that they can feel empowered and in control. I think you guys will wanna get a, a notebook, a pen and a pencil so that you can take notes throughout today's talk. And David, I am super excited to have you here tonight. I'm excited to be here, thank you. Absolutely. So David, tell us a little bit about how you got started helping people get their finances in control. Sure. Well, it all started uh, around six years ago. I suddenly retired from medicine. And at that time, people started asking me, how the heck did I manage to do this for myself? Because I was only 45 at the time. So I tried to explain to people how I invested. I even wrote a book about it. And people started asking me if I would invest for them. So, you know, sometimes life just happens for you. Once you close one door, other doors open and... I decide, wow, you know, this is a chance for me to become the fiduciary that I wish I had when I was a broke intern. Wow, wow. So you came out of um, medical school broke and then created yes. your practice. And then from your practice, you actually started investing for yourself and got good at it and people wanted you to help them. Exactly. In fact, back when I was just starting as an intern, I was a Right out of medical school, I had my first paycheck. I was pretty uh, financially naive, and I quickly found out that real life has teeth. So uh, I reached that proverbial rock bottom where there's more month than money. You have your sleepless nights, knots in your stomach, and I just got to this rock bottom place where I said to myself, you know, how do you get this part of my life handled? And that's when I decided to really get this part of my life handled, start reading a lot, and eventually I formed systems that worked for me as a busy professional because I couldn't be watching markets all the time. And, uh, but at the same time, I knew that buy, hold, and pray was just deadly. And so you weren't interested in becoming a day trader sitting in front of the computer all day, but you had to develop some systems that made sense to you. Exactly. I love it. And you know, I think so many of us struggle with this. I know for myself, um, this is not where I want to spend my time and energy. It's not my zone of genius. So I look to people like you or, you know, my financial advisors to really give me guidance on this. And I really have so much appreciation for the knowledge um, that people like you share with us. So I know my guests are going to get a lot from our our conversation today. Yes. So David, why do you think it is that the system that you developed is so impactful? Okay, well, most people are taught to buy, hold, and basically pray, uh, <laughs> whether or not markets go up or down. And yes, in general, in the long, long term, markets tend to go up. And even then, it's still not a guarantee. And I can't guarantee anything either. However, I can say that most mistakes that people make in the markets are when they make decisions. And decisions that are specifically decisions are based on emotions. Mm. Because if you think about it, money in general and markets in particular, it's all emotion. Yeah. People are happy, they buy stocks, stock markets go up. People are scared or unhappy. People sell stocks and stock markets go down. Uh, and it can seemingly follow random patterns in their news or wars or whatever, but patterns in the market, if you take a look at it objectively, there are ways to look at it uh, where you can just take the emotion out of it. And once you take the emotion out of it, clearer patterns come out. Yeah, that's, I love that you, um you link it to emotion because I know for myself, when I look at my accounts 
and they're up, my emotions are really happy. And then when things crash for a day or two or a month or two, like back in January, I was kind of freaking out and I didn't have the knowledge to be able to look at things as objectively. So I'm looking forward to learning from you today as well. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, David, I usually ask my guests for a pro tip, but um, today you have brought us a whole presentation. And yes. um, I'm so excited to dive into this. So I want to invite you to go ahead and share your screen with us and walk sure. us through uh, some of the magic that you create. Sure. So I give talks to a lot of other busy professionals as well. And here's your chance to pick my brain. This really is my brain back when I was a resident. I'm a radiologist, so uh, we work with scans all the time. And what I like to start out with is, I don't know how many of us have done personal development work specifically with Tony Robbins. I love that he published this book roughly when I was starting out as an investment advisor, because this book, not only is it very popular, but it simplifies a lot of things. So for instance, any book that you read will give you some variation of a bucket system. Mm -hmm. And any system that you implement won't work unless you can spend less than you make. Mm -hmm. In other words, pay yourself first. And the question is, what do you do with those pay yourself first funds? Well, first, you have the security bucket oh, or yeah. the safety bucket. This is a bucket where you put funds where you know that if you have an emergency, or you, know, you never know if emergencies come up, but just in case emergencies come up, or if you have known fixed short-term goals, like you know that your roof needs replacing maybe two, three years from now, you know, some place where you know that your money is not going to lose value. And then you have your growth or risk bucket. I like how Tony emphasizes this is a risk bucket because any kind of investment, if you're going to have growth, there's going to be some element of risk. In other words, there's a possibility you could lose money as well. Mm -hmm. There are ways to mitigate this risk, but it's always risk. And then, of course, you have your dream bucket because a lot of us save and invest, but like my parents, they never really rewarded themselves mm -hmm. and they live a life of, you know, they live life, but they don't really get to enjoy life as much as they could have. Yeah. On the other hand, I'm sure we all know people who live hand to mouth, spend everything they make, they live in the dream bucket mm -hmm. and they don't save or invest. And yeah. financial life is a balance of these three buckets. Yeah, and David, I just want to stop you right now and I yeah. want to just talk about this dream bucket for a second because, yeah. you know, a lot of what we're doing um, in, like in my coaching is I help people like envision what their very best life looks like. And yes. one, of the, one of the things that I talk a lot about is you know, taking inspired action to move us forward. And it's so easy to go into law of attraction, I want this, but not see that I actually have to take inspired action and take care of my security bucket, my growth bucket, and my dream bucket. And as I add to my dream bucket, that's where I'm really fulfilling those, those big dreams and, and visions that I have. Exactly. Oh, in, fact, in fact, I have a little graphic on how to picture these three buckets working together. What we're trying to do is we're trying to build a machine that will help us get to where we want to go. Mm. So for instance, we take a look at if we just had a growth bucket and a safety bucket, we are making a money machine where we can grow old, we can grow rich, but you know, without the dream bucket, it has a, it's a relatively boring life. <laughs> However, some of us have a dream bucket and all we have is a growth bucket. What machine we're building is a hot rod. Uh -huh. We live fast, die young, but without any safety seatbelt, wow. crash is inevitable. And, and of course, if we have just a safety bucket and a dream bucket, then yes, we're saving, we're 
uh, moving along. We, we have a battle tank. It's unstoppable, but it's also very slow. Mm -hmm. So we may not even avoid even our most modest goals if we go too slowly. So if we combine the three together, we can make a machine that will help us afford the dream life where we can live our passions forever. I love this. So this is straight out of Tony's book, The Money Machine we was talking about before. Hey David, let me just, um, in case anybody's uh, listening on audio, the name of the book, could you just say the name of the book? The name of the book is Money Master the Game. By Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Okay. Yeah. And for people who are listening, what I'm showing here is a graphic of a money machine where you have a graphic of a person who's saving a percentage of his earnings every paycheck or every pay period or every client check and saving into some money machine where eventually there'll be a critical capital mass of capital where this critical capital mass will provide income for life. Of course, literally, the million dollar question is how big does this critical capital mass have to be? Yeah. And for most investment advisors, they'll give you a questionnaire. And it's usually a multi-page or a very complicated looking questionnaire with all these different uh, numbers that you have to put in. Many of them you have to make up anyway, and many of which are going to change over life anyway. So what I like about what Tony does in his book is he stratifies your potential goals. So for instance, uh, he'll go over six levels of financial whatever. So you have the, your basic financial stability, then you have financial security, and then you have financial vitality, and then you have your financial independence level, financial freedom level, and absolute financial freedom level. So you can get a feel for each level feels a little bit more secure or more powerful than the previous. And what I like to think about is, if you're just learning finances or if you're just getting back on your feet, when you learn how to shoot at a target, you put the target closer to you first. So for instance, if you're going for financial security, you put the target maybe 10 meters away and you shoot at it with a bow and arrow. And once you get good at that, you put the target maybe 20 meters away and see if you can hit that. And maybe 50 meters away, financial independence, now you might be using a shotgun or something. Mm -hmm. And then you put 100 meters away, financial freedom, now you're looking at a high part of rifle or something. And eventually, you go for a moonshot, where you go for absolute financial freedom. Obviously, each target gets harder to hit, but at the same time, you're upgrading your skill level and your tools to get you there. Wow, I love this moonshot. That is such a great word. Yes. So, just as a graphic, anyone who has this video, you can just pause your video and or just look directly at Tony's book on these basic levels of you know, financial security, absolute financial freedom. How do we calculate these all? Yeah. So what we'd like to do, at least in this session is, just look at financial security because all it is, again, I love simplification. It just requires five things. That's it. Housing, utilities, transportation, food, and insurance. These are fixed costs. And we'll, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later. But if you can just get your fixed costs handled for the rest of your life forever with enough of a critical capital mass, how would you feel? Yeah. Right. These are, these are great descriptors that really helps to break down. You know, a lot of people say, I want financial freedom, but we don't really know what that is, or we want financial security, but what is that? So these, um, these definitions here are really powerful, empowering, I should say. Exactly. And with the law of attraction, the more specific you are in your vision, the more likely that you'll come to fruition. Where your energy, where you focus is where energy goes? Yes, where you focus is where your energy goes, yes. So this is a, just an exercise that we can do, taking a few minutes, or we can just pause the video right now and just 
calculate this out, but I'll just go over this very quickly. All you have are these five costs. If you can figure out the per month cost for your housing, in other words, your rent or mortgage, your per month cost of your food or house and Let's household. Let's do this together. Let's just take a second. And hey, viewers, go ahead and pull out your pencil and your journal that um, you brought to this session. And let's just calculate this right now. This is such an opportunity for you to figure out what your financial security is. So David's going to walk you through it really slowly. And we're going to give you about, you know, 20 seconds, 10 seconds to, you know, just, you know, these numbers already. So go ahead and just jot them down. So the first number would be your housing, so your rent or mortgage that if you've been you know, paying. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this with you right now. Sure. So if you do this every month, you probably have a good idea of what this number is anyway. Then for your food and household, you can estimate how much you actually pay for groceries and you, know, you don't have to necessarily put down your dining out number. because this would be something that would be your bare minimum that we're trying to calculate. Okay, bare minimum. Mm -hmm. Then your utilities, including gas, electric, water, and phone. Right. Yeah, this is usually where people start to try to think, geez, how much do I pay on this again every month? <laughs> well, I, I was asking my question, myself a question, do I include my internet in that? And I, and I decided yes, because that is something I can't live without. Exactly. In this day and age, definitely. It's like your phone. Exactly. Then your transportation, so whether or not you commute or own or rent, lease. Oh yeah, okay, actually the, like a, a, a loan payment would go in there. Exactly. Okay. For some people and, lease. And would you include your gas, your monthly gas? Your gas, your Uber, your parking costs if you have to pay for parking at work. or if you're renting and you have to rent your garage as well. Okay. And once you have these five numbers, add them all up, get that total. Okay, don't forget the insurance payment, guys. Go Very ahead, whatever your insurance is every month, go ahead and include that. Exactly, so we're talking about your homeowners or renters insurance, we're not talking life insurance. We're just talking about basic necessities. So your umbrella insurance. Oh, like my car insurance too, or would that go under transportation? It can go in either one as long as that number is in these five categories. Okay. I'm gonna get my calculator out here. Hey, let's see what see what this number is. <laughs> this is like a detective novel. You know, we're putting the pieces together and trying to find the ending. Yeah, it's more than I expected it to be. And then once you get that total, you multiply by that 12, and that'll get your yearly expense. Yeah, okay. Well, that is really helpful. It just sets that baseline. That's financial security right there, that number. Exactly, and then multiply that number by 25. Oh, look at that. And if you achieve that number, that's enough to cover all this forever. Wow. 
that just makes it really simple, doesn't it? Yep. And this way we have a target. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I hope that was helpful to everybody watching. I hope you were able to jot down some numbers and just find your own baseline for your financial security number. Wow. So now that we have a target, let's introduce the concept again for critical capital mass, because ultimately what's going to happen is we're going to at least plan for a time when, I mean, I mean, I know a lot of us are entrepreneurs. We want to work forever because it's our passion. In fact, some people do like Warren Buffett. He's 90 years old. He's still going strong, putting in 12 hour days because you know, he's one guy who could definitely retire, but this is just something he's made for. So he's going to go on forever. But some of us are not so lucky. Like, my dad, he was working until he was 70 something and he had a stroke, so he had to retire from work. And there will be times when we can no longer rely on trading our time for money. And when we get to that point, then we're reliant on this critical capital mass to keep us alive until, you know, forever. So many of us, when we're getting to this critical capital mass, think about getting, walk, climbing a mountain. Why do people climb mountains? Oh, that's a good question. Why do people climb mountains? Exactly. Why do people climb mountains? Most so people get to the top. Most people want to get to the top. Get to Cuckoo Capital Mass. That's why they focus on accumulation phase. But actually, if you talk to mountain climbers, they want to get down the other side safely. Mm -hmm. Good and point. that requires more planning. Yeah. So if you take a look at our moonshot example, we remember Kennedy saying that we should commit ourselves to getting a man on the moon and reaching him safely back to Earth again. We remember the moon part. But remember that part of what Kennedy was saying was returning him safely to Earth. Mm -hmm. That's the whole program. That's the whole challenge because it's easy, relatively easy getting something or someone to the moon by getting back. And just a note about a moonshot, we were talking about moonshots before. It's not just throwing money at something and hoping for the best. That's mm. what a lot of people think about. Actually, the whole moon program was trying to figure out all these problems that could happen and planning ways to get around them, and putting together all these moving parts into a system that eventually got them to the moon. So, you know, our planning doesn't have to be as complicated as the actual moonshot. However, it does take some planning. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the taking the inspired action, putting exactly. the plan into motion and not just, you know, dreaming, but, but taking the steps forward to make it happen. Exactly. I mean, once we have a vision and we start taking inspired action, we can let the law of attraction take over from there, but at least we're still doing our part. We're in the game. Exactly. So here's one concept I'd like to show you on how to visualize. Uh, back when I was a poor broke intern, I heard Tony Robbins say something that stuck with me. And that is, we often underestimate what we can do in one year, but overestimate what we can do in 10 years. That's so a great I, quote. yeah. So, I, okay, well, let me talk, apply this to finances. I knew where I was, I knew how much I had, and I thought, wow, you know, if I could just get this number by the time I retire, that would be so amazing. So, okay, well, what if I underestimate what I can do in 10 years, and let's say I can get that number in 10 years. Well, when I made that big number into a 10-year goal, that scared me. And <laughs> I bet it did. Oh, yeah. So if you have a goal that's big enough to scare you, that's probably a good goal. <laughs> okay. And so, all right, uh, being the nerd I was, I plotted out where I needed to be at any one time on my way to gain that goal. And then what I did was every week, I looked at all my finances, took all my bank accounts, brokerage accounts, subtracted credit card debt, things like that. I got a number and every month. David, you did this every week? Every week. Wow. 
But think about it this way. If you're trying to lose weight, would it be more or less likely to lose weight if you weighed yourself once a year versus once a month? This is true. Or once a month versus once a week. Yeah. So I did once a week. And at the time, it's because I was also, to be fair, I was doing some pretty aggressive trading as well, where if I wasn't that careful, it could easily spin out of control. So at least one week for me. And I like to think about it this way also. Most investing stops during the weekends. Mm. So between Friday, 5 p.m. and Monday, 8.30 a.m., prices don't change and I have a nice static view of what my finances look like. So I would plot every week and I got this graph. So you can see for several years, I was actually along that line and I was very proud of myself. But yeah. then... What, what my, timeline is that? How many years is that? Well, from here to here is 10 years. Okay, so that's three, four years. Um, so three, four years. That was four years, exactly. 1996 to 2000, because this is when the stock market crash started. Okay. And uh, of course, I also bought my house. and uh, But then I got back on my feet again and... I got my goal. Yeah. Was in 12 years. I got in 12 years, not 10 years, but holy cow, you know? Yeah, this was right. Yeah, right. And, and it's okay that we have a little wiggle room in our goals. They're not set in stone. And, and, but we're still succeeding as we keep moving forward, even though it took two extra years. Exactly. So, you know, this was a goal that I thought I'd be lucky to hit by retirement. Jeez. But yeah, where your intention is, where your focus is, energy flows. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to touch on this. This is a lot of data, David. This is a lot of data, yes. So hold on to your seat. If you have to pause this video and just take a breath, go ahead. That's the good, good news about video is that uh, if you do get overwhelmed, you don't have to stick around. You know, if we can just get up, dance around a little bit, get, the, get our energy back. Yeah. Okay, so let's okay. dive into this. Dive into this. So this is what happens once we get our critical capital mass. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. It looks complicated, but basically we have twins, Connie and Daphne. They both have 500,000. They both live in this universe where they have a stock market that returns 8.03% annualized return. Okay. And they're both withdrawing money 5% the first year, and then 3% more each year to index for inflation. The only difference is in Connie's universe, the stock market returns are in this particular sequence, minus 10% one year, minus 13% the next year, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Daphne, the exact same numbers, exact same annualized return, but the order of return or the sequence of return is flipped over. So let's see what the effects are. So in Connie's world, she takes money out every year, and after 20 years, she runs out of money. Wow. wow. Daphne, though, takes money out every year, and after 25 years, she still has this huge critical capital mass, and she can go on forever. She can support her sister. <laughs> yeah, or give away to charity or something. Uh, no, but David, you know, I think uh, the devil's advocate, advocate would say, hey, you know, I can't control the returns I'm getting every year. Exactly. We cannot control the sequence of returns. However, what we can do is notice how the reason why Connie runs out of money so soon is that she's taking money out when she suffers a loss. Okay. And when she takes money out when there's a loss... She's locking in those losses, yeah. not giving her risk bucket time to recover. Oh. So, aha, you know, let's back test this. Let's say we now have two twins, Connie and Sally. They're both same starting period, 500,000 in the bank. They both have the exact same stock market now with the exact same returns, and they're withdrawing at the exact same rate. The only difference is with Sally, when there's a stock market loss, she does not take money out of the risk bucket. Okay. 
she instead has a safety bucket that she she's taking. She has a safety bucket. So this is how you can get those buckets to work together with each other. Yeah, so that really pulls it together, right? That's why we have this safety bucket so that we're not always withdrawing from, you know, our dream bucket. Exactly. So what's, if we do what Sally does and just take money out of the safety bucket instead of the risk bucket, when there's a loss that year or the previous year, then at the end of 25 years, she still has a sizable bucket and she can go on forever. Now, yeah. here's a problem. Sally, in this example, there were six years out of 25 where there was a market loss. And that means she had to have a large enough safety bucket to cover six mm -hmm. years worth of losses, mm -hmm. six years worth of income. That's a huge safety bucket. So what if we only had to have a safety bucket that was only covering three years worth of losses? If Sally only covered the first three years of losses, and these are the worst years too, because they're right in the beginning where it hurts most. Towards the end, after 25 years, she still again has a sizable safety bucket, uh, risk bucket, and she can go on forever. I see. So she had withdrawn in three of the years that had lost, but not the three very first years, which are compounding um, at a higher, I don't know, percentage rate more because it's at the beginning. Exactly. So losses in the beginning count more than losses towards the end. Yeah. And we're covering just those losses in the beginning that hurt the most. Mm. So we only have a few moving parts. We have a risk bucket. We have a safety bucket. And can we improve on this? On, can we improve on the system? Yeah. Well, obviously, we can improve on our safety bucket. We can also improve on our risk bucket. This is why I wrote my book. What if there was a way where we can cut down on these losses? Yeah. So, this is where, you know, I, I, in my former life, I was a radiologist. And anytime I looked at any scan, doesn't matter if it was an MRI, CT, ultrasound, the raw data that came out of these scanners were uninterpretable to the human eye. We had to use some kind of mathematical filter to filter the data, scoped into a way that we could interpret the images. Well, here we are investing in the markets. And it's very easy to see that there are patterns. In the past, there were times when the markets were going up and when the markets were going down. Okay. Problem, problem is markets also wiggle. Mm. So you see how they wiggle up and down. And we never know if the next wiggle down is really just a small wiggle or if there really is a change in trend. So what I do is I just apply a mathematical filter this yellow line. So for those of us who are just listening in on this, I have here a picture of a market chart where there's a black wiggly line representing market data per month and a more smooth yellow line. And we see if the market is above this yellow line, it tends to be relatively safe. No matter how much it wiggles, it tends to be going up over time. Mm. However, if we're checking this just once a month, not every day, but not every once a year either, once a month, and the markets go below this yellow line, it tends to keep on going down for months to years. Mm -hmm. So if we're only checking this once a month, what if we could detect these changes in pattern early enough to make a difference? Wow, that's powerful. So now we can just detect when these big, bigger losses, at least we can't protect against all losses, but at least the bigger ones. If we can protect against the bigger losses, then we can make our critical capital mass stretch out a lot longer. Yeah. Now, we can also make it grow somewhat faster because we're not losing, because these losses are larger than we think. And this is how I mean. If we lose 25%, we have to make 33% just to break even. Oh, wow. Okay. If we lose 
like how we did twice in the last 20 years, we have to make 100% just to break even. Wow. And that means we're losing time trying to break even. So if we can detect when the losses are dangerous enough to get out of the markets, we can prevent those losses and we don't lose that much time on our way up. Okay. That so, makes sense. Yeah. So this is where I try to explain things the way I think, and I try to explain things with graphs. I'm a picture person. I was a radiologist. And people who listen to this, if you're trying to picture what I'm trying to show you, this is a real-life example with real data from an index mutual fund. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with what a mutual fund is, if you know what a stock is, think about a company where all they do is buy stock. If we, were to tr if we had $1,000 in our bank account and we wanted to buy stocks and diversify over the 500 biggest stocks in the country, there's no way we have enough money in our bank account to buy all those stocks. Right. However, if we have one company called a mutual fund that has billions of dollars and all they do is buy the stocks of those 500 companies, if you buy one share of that mutual fund, you've essentially bought little pieces of all 500 stocks that you want to own. Mm -hmm. Well, the S&P 500 index mutual fund is one of the most widely followed indexes and one of the most widely held mutual funds. So if this mutual fund represented what we could have gotten in the stock market, the yellow line here is if the black line goes below the red line, when it's dangerous to be in stocks, we sell the stock market fund and we just stay in cash. Mm -hmm. That's why it's flat here. And then when the black line goes above the red line, then it's safe to be back in the market and we just buy the stock mutual fund again and we go up. Yep. When it's dangerous to be in a stock market again, we sell the stock the mutual fund and we stay in cash. So we're flat again for these few years. And then when it's safe enough, we go back in. And then this gray line is instead of holding cash, when it's dangerous to be in stocks, we just switch to a bond fund. It's a mutual fund that holds bonds. And that's usually because when stocks are crashing, people send, tend to sell stocks and buy something they think is relatively safe, usually bonds. Okay. Not always, but at least in the long term, it's worked so far. So all I do is switch between a stock and bond fund. So I'm diversifying over time, not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we're making this graph safer it doesn't crash as much as often wow yeah that's a lot to take in but i can see how your mathematical filter helps us create points of where we need to put our attention you know okay it's exactly the line so what do we do now this is our opportunity to make a change Exactly. So we're keeping our attention here only once a month. And it's a very simple calculation. Yeah. And, you know, David and I have been in the same coaching program together. And one of the things our mentor has said to us over and over again, and I think this really um, illustrates it quite well, is that, you know, tracking, just keeping track of things that helps keep our attention. And, and like David said earlier, you know, money flows where attention goes or energy flows where attention goes. So when we pay attention and we actively participate in that monitoring, you know, it really gives us quite a, a different perspective uh, of life in, in all things, not just the stock market. Exactly. So I know that uh, usually you only have like 30 minutes. I know I'm way over time. But, um, yeah, we've yeah. got another, you know, if we went an hour, we have another 10 minutes. All right. So this is about all I, I should present in this time because otherwise I can talk all day about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, why don't we talk about some of the clients that you've helped and 
and how you've made a big difference in their life. I think we'd all love to hear some real world stories. Sure. So well, go ahead and unshare your screen okay. so we can see you again. And um, yeah, there we go. Perfect. That was really great, David. Thanks for breaking that down. Sure. So tell us, give us some real, real world stories. Well, you know, when I first started showing my systems, uh, I had clients who were crying because they were so lost in their finances. And when they finally saw clarity, and more importantly, they saw hope. Yeah. I mean, th this is why I wanted to do this. I mean, I went to medical school to be for a reason. And now that I'm burned out in the medical field, now I'm doing something else where I'm actually helping people at a really deep personal level mm. and just transforming lives this way. People don't realize that, you know, there's all these taboo in our society about, oh, money is evil, rich people are evil, greed is evil. And a lot of us have these mental blocks that just repel money. And that's like the inverse law of attraction. But the problem is yeah. money is just as important I mean, I like to think about it this way. There's a little kid who asked the mom, what's more important, love or money? So, the mom. <laughs> yeah. so the mom said, well, love is what makes the world go around. But if you don't have money, you're in big trouble. <laughs> so the little kid got it. And that's what we need to get wrap our heads around because yeah. money is energy. So once you get that hope, life changes. And I've had other clients who were burned out and they just needed some hope to get out. And once, you know, there are a couple of clients already that I've helped organize their finances enough so that they saw the path they could be and they found out they actually did have enough to at least not completely retired, but at least step down comfortably and just, you know, they don't have to worry about finding another job or another profession, another career immediately. They can just can find themselves and find what really was their passion and go for that. You know, that's really huge. I think money and money is one of the greatest sources of anxiety for all of us. And so many, so many of us have these these preconceived notions about, you know, a penny earned is a penny saved or pen. Yeah. And, and while all of that is true, it kind of puts a lot of pressure on us. So to have a system or a method that breaks it down um, where we can have that clarity and we can have that hope, that's, that is such service to humanity because Boy, I know for a long time, I really got wrapped up in the whole money thing. It was scary. Yeah. Yes. And these burnout physicians, you know, how effective do you think they were, were at work? Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Just trying to rescue them to do something that, that they're passionate about. That's key, you know, because this is when their true self really shines. Right. Exactly. I, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, if we're trudging through a job that we hate, you know, we are creating illness in our body. But what I love that you said about this example of the couple um, that you helped to give some hope to is that they were able to see that they could take that pause and retool a little bit from something that was not satisfying into something that they felt much more passion and attraction for. So that exactly. really is huge. Exactly. And sometimes we just need this little break because, you know, I'm taking physicians as an example, but to, in order to be a physician, going through medical school and then going through residency and then using time to build your practice, you've spent so many years in that profession that becomes your identity. So just thinking about doing anything else is so far out that they're not just stuck in their job because of money. It's just the whole identity is just wrapped up in that place. And so, so even though they were really stressed out, just the thought of leaving is incomprehensible. Right. 
Well, and also so, it's the sunk cost, right? The sunk cost of all the education and all the investment of time and money into that system. Sometimes it's, exactly. you know, our, our ego really holds on to those sunk costs. Like, oh my God, I can't let go of that. But letting go is sometimes the very best choice. Exactly. Hmm. Interesting. David, this has been marvelous. I really hope my viewers are ex excited about this information as I am. And I would love for you to, first of all, I want to know the name of your book in case anyone is interested. You know, the book is called The Busy Doctor's Investment Guide. The Busy Doctor's Investment Guide by David Yeh. Okay, guys. Exactly. And then how can people get in touch with you? Um, how do you work with people? If somebody wanted to work with you to straighten out their finances, what would be the best way, best point of contact? You know, what's your modality? Well, the best way would be to just talk to me. I mean, I love teaching. I love talking about this stuff. And that's why I'm doing this to begin with. So even if people just want to talk to me about, hey, I read your book or, hey, can you give me some pointers to shortcut the book because, you know, instead of spending hours reading a book, even though it's a very thin book, just a 45 minute talk with me can help clarify what's going on in their lives and I'm willing to set up time. So they can either go to my website, wealthydoctorinstitute.com. Wealthydoctorinstitute.com. We'll put that in the notes below. Okay. Okay. Or if they want to schedule something directly with me, they can just go to calldavidye.com. Well, that's easy. Yeah. And that everyone this way they can just yay y e h call david yay y e h. Okay. Well, we'll make sure to get that in our comments. And this way, it's easy to find a time slot that works for you and. For that hour, I'm all yours. And we can zoom and screen share things and explain things a little bit more clearly. Oh, and is there a charge for this hour, this, uh, this session? It's totally free. There's no expectation either way. Uh, if you walk away empowered, that's why I'm here, you know? Oh, David, what I an incredible gift. gift. What an incredible gift. So, you know, Viewers, if you do contact David, please let him know that you found him through this interview. It's really important for him to know where people are coming from. And I'm so curious if any of you take him up on it because I just know that it's going to be life changing. In fact, I am going to take him up on this too. So <laughs> wonderful, David. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your deep thoughts on all of this. It's, um, it's really important. This is one of the most important and scary topics for us. So thanks for demystifying it. Thanks for doing this for your audience. Yeah, wonderful. We're, we're trying to spread the word on all these things. And, you know, we need people to just be the spark, you know? Be the spark. Yeah. Thank you, David. Well, you are the spark. You are one of those amazing sparks out in the world. And just love and appreciate your work. Um, everyone, thanks for joining us and thanks for staying with us for this extended Tuesday talk tonight. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks with another amazing special guest. Thank you, David. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>